Thank you. My subject is S 2012, a vision fulfilled question mark. Well, of course, I can answer part of that question right away with yes, with the very fact that we are here today, 20 years later. It was a wonderful idea. And I would like to thank the organizers very much for the idea and all their hard work. And also thank you all for coming. And um, it's been wonderful meeting a lot of old friends and new friends, and uh, not only of the old generation. But, um, and um, I hope that you are enjoying the conference as much as we have other co EST conferences. On the um, home page of EST, you read um, EST was conceived in 1992. Um, actually, it was born in 1992. Um, as Anthony said this morning, it was in this room in, on the 12th of September, I think. And like everything else that's born, it's conceived quite a long time beforehand. And I would like to tell you some of that part. Susanna has actually touched on it because it explains quite a lot of things and answers some questions that came up this morning. And it is, um, there are people and things and developments that have now, I think, been totally forgotten. Uh, first of all, you mentioned 1989. That was the time when I was appointed here in Vienna. And as you all know, it was the famous fall of the Berlin Wall. And I don't think if you hadn't experienced that, and many of you, of course, probably can't remember it or different or, or didn't, um, you can't imagine the effect it had on everybody. And here in Vienna, up till then, um, Europe had really been um, ruthlessly divided. And Vienna was at the tail end, let's say, of Western Europe. And then all of a sudden, we were in the center of Europe. People could travel, people could meet each other. And nowadays, it's so obvious and so self-evident that I don't think people would remember what it was like. Will you agree? And it was an atmosphere of tremendous euphoria. And this meant that actually Europe was growing together. It was quite different from the idea of Europe today. First of all that, I'm coming back to the idea of Europeanness later. And secondly, it was a time when in Western Europe, um, nation states were actually, their borders were quite rigid. You had to change money and you had customs and things like this, if you can imagine that. And um, the idea of a European society was then, was to overcome these national borders. First of all that, and secondly, of course, the growing together of um, East Europe and West Europe. And um, we had um, a symposium before the founding of EST in November 1991. It was a Mittel Europäische Symposium. And um, this was for me a, a key event. And um, I remember that um, there was war going on in Croatia. And um, some people went to tremendous efforts to come there and the joy that they had in being there. And um, there were all sorts of topics, and one was actually the beginnings of what we know now as ATV, audiovisual translation, which was later developed, or much later. And um, there was this book then published in Prague in 1995 that um, first, let's say, brought a lot of us together. And um, then secondly, we had the idea of expert meetings. I actually happened for my um, inaugural lecture, which is also in this room. And when I invited scholars, um, well-known scholars at the time, Hans Vermeer, Just uh, Mentori, Hans Hönig, uh, Paul Kussmaul, Christiane Nord, and various others, and we had a meeting about the new discipline then, the translation studies, which was emancipating itself from um, uh, linguistics and from literary studies. And we called these immodestly the translation summits, Translationsgipfel. We had several of these and they were tremendously um, stimulating. And um, the ideas gradually developed that um, we should have a translation studies congress. This was in 1992. And um, this was when Est was actually born. And um, after all these, um, this intense preparation, you can imagine that it was actually quite an easy birth. Um, the um, languages uh, of the Congress, so I, perhaps I should like to say that the 
um, Mitteleuropäische Symposium was held in the lecture hall number one, where we have um, interpreting booths. And it was translated simultaneously by students into um, half a dozen languages, seven, I think. Um, we have from where to where. I'd just like you to note that. In 1992, we had three conference languages, English, French, and German, of which a third were either in, um, German, in German or French. And um, we realized that to be more um, international, that we would have to stop um, using German as our language. It all actually started here as in German and to change to English. Um, Anthony mentioned this this morning in saying that in the Constitution you have that English is the language of the society. Now that has a special reason, that um, we need to have a language and if we had had more than one conference language, more than one society language, every single document that we produced would have to be translated into those languages. And um, you can imagine it was a, a vast amount of work anyway. And so to simplify things, we had English as a working language, a working language, I like to emphasize, and not a language for future conferences where everything has to be held and discussed in English. I'm coming back to that just now. Um, we actually had a model for um, the S, the European Society of Translation Studies, and this might also explain many things about the Constitution because um, uh, this goes back to the other society, and that was Eurolex. I don't know whether you've heard of Eurolex. That is a European Society for Lexicography. European Association, sorry, Eurolex. European Association for Lexicography. And it's still going strong. You can Google it, and it's still having lots of meetings, um, and of which I was a member of the board in the 1980s. And um, the, these were also, the 1980s were a tremendous time for the development of translation studies and the golden age of lexicography. And um, lexicographers were at the same time scholars. They were really big names, Tony Cowie, all the OUP people, Anna Ray, um, Antonio Zampoli, and the co-build people. And um, when I came here in uh, 1989, I thought that we would um, transfer the same idea perhaps to translation studies. And as there are a lot of big names here at this institute in translation and in interpretation, I thought that they would all be absolutely delighted. Well, uh, that was very naive. I mean, some were. And some are here today. And um, this is, again, another, this is how it came about that in our constitution, we have not only scholars and teachers, as you see again in the homepage or in the Horford papers, but um, also practitioners of translation. And we wanted to integrate the translator training institutions. Now this is my second point because that was a, a very ambitious um, idea and it's still a very moot point that I'd rather not go into. And in some cases it worked and in some cases it didn't. At the beginning we had a lot of members from this institute. I don't know how many there are now. Um, at the beginning of the 90s there was some wonderful institutes of translation that now don't exist. One was, I like to remember, mention was Tampere in Finland, where Jostohot's mentor worked. It has meanwhile been absorbed by the language departments. Also the University of Warwick, which has been closed. It was closed in, 19, in 2009. At the other end of the scale, however, and I must mention this, there are um, translator training institutions which have had to develop a tremendous, a wonderful reputation for translation studies as well. One is um, Graz, and this is certainly due to, and many people of course, but particularly to the absolutely stupendous commitment of Erich Prunch. And I think that's something one must mention. And also Germersheim, and it was no, wasn't any chance, I thought it was very interesting that um, people, one person was chosen from Germersheim, one from Graz. There again, there were many people who worked there, Hönig and Kusma worked there too, and many professors as well. But um, a lot of the uh, reputation of Germersheim goes back to the, the brilliance of Hans Vermeer. And so um, I'll miss out points there, but the translator training schools, the um, integration of theory and practice. That was a big idea in the, in the 1990s, that, tra that practitioners said that theorists can't give us anything, and theorists said that, translate, that practitioners don't want to learn, and so on. This has always been a big issue, and it definitely was then. 
and translators training was actually um, quite an important um, issue. And so we founded IST, and I don't know whether you saw the, you've seen the picture of the first board on the, uh, first executive board on the second floor. You might have been rather surprised to see there Sergio Viaggio, and you might wonder what he was doing. The reason was that he was actually elected um, Secretary General, but being um, uh, very busy uh, in an international conference interpreter for the United Nations, he hadn't the time to um, put in that one needs for this job. That became very clear very soon. And so his place was taken by the, person, the second person on the list, and that was Franz Perchaka. And um, of the board, I think this has already been mentioned, that this was a lot of hard work. Also, Radegundis Stolze, who was treasurer <coughs> until 2007 for 15 years, for those two people, I think I really have to say it was a joy to work with you. It was a style of work I like, quiet efficiency, a bit of criticism here and there and everywhere, no prima donna allures and so on. And um, that was a very happy time. And Franz, well, unfortunately, Radegundis is not here, but Franz, I'd like to say here, thank you very much indeed for all that you've done for the society. Without you, we wouldn't be here. Because these first years were actually very important. Of course, as I say, it was every day down to earth details. So I can't go into them all. I would also like to mention the, the newsletter that came up this morning, Daniel Gilles with José Lambert started that. And the logo that you see, that you've seen everywhere, was designed by Jürgen Schopp. Secondly, I'd like to mention the cooperation with Benjamin's publishers. The, um, my book that was just been mentioned, Translation Studies and Integrated Approach, was published with Benjamin's, and Bertie Carr was then the um, editor for um, us. And the series, Benjamin's Translation Library, meanwhile there are a lot, I don't know how many is, uh, volumes there are, was actually founded here um, through the Translation Studies Congress, and our volume of proceedings was supposed to be the first one. Actually, someone else came out and um, put, they were number one. We were then number two. And I very much regret to say a second volume of proceedings that we've, uh, we've planned, and I rather think Anthony Pym's paper was among them. The other publisher let us down, and to this day I, I remember how um, embarrassed I feel about it. But the, with Benjamins we've had, you've seen their books outside, um, many years of good cooperation. And then we had the first EST uh, conference, uh, Congress in Prague, which was wonderful. <laughs> there, I won't go into that anymore. We all enjoyed it tremendously. Just so you get an idea of what things were like, am I right in remembering that in the building we had, there was a total party? And so there we were, and I remember, um, I remember <laughs> then sort of trundling overhead projectors to another, another building, building, but it worked. Somehow it worked. Without all the technology, it was, it was actually your organization, your wonderful organization that, that made it work. Then we had, there were three more years. One thing that I inherited from Eurolex was the idea that a president's term of office should be limited to two. I think that's more than enough for a president to be in a society. And we started off with some idea of awards, scholarship, and so on. And the first one was a Young Scholar Award. I would like to mention that the idea was mine. And now I'm delighted to see that it's taken on, and many young scholars have been um, um, helped by it. Um, Anthony Pym mentioned last night that perhaps Est was a place of repose for us all. I think back to these years, and up to 1998, and how hard I found it to juggle family and family problems and illnesses and so on with the work here at the Institute and the work for EST. Actually, it was a, a tremendous amount of work. And um, as I say, it's unspectacular, but it was there. And um, I think that after two uh, terms of office, it was a good time to have a change. Yes, and then came Granada. The microphone. Sorry, is that better? Yes, thank you. Um, then came Granada. It um, wasn't, the conference, the Congress worked actually very well, but there was something here that um, turned up that has been important, it's been an issue since, and I feel that I must mention it, and that is the question of language policy. And um, in the Granada, I'd gone to tremendous efforts to make sure that the Spanish colleagues, and the, there was a lot of work going on in the 1990s in Spain, um, had, um, a section of their own, and also would take part in the proceedings. 
It is part of the policy of S, part of the policy of Benjamins, that we were to concentrate on English. And of course, the Spaniards were absolutely furious, and anybody who was present there, I don't think we'll ever forget that. And um, I would like to point out that um, we are European, I'm coming back to this, and this includes linguistic diversity. I know the volume of Spanish contributions was, in, was supposed to be published, I don't think it ever was. And this is something that I, rather worries me, this um, idea of the absolute dominance of global English. Anyone who's heard me over the last few years knows, knows that I've spoken about this several times. Um, we now have the European Union. We have the Treaty of Lisbon. We have many values of which um, we ought to be very proud and thankful and grateful, and I'm, I'm a convinced European. And one of these is cultural and linguistic diversity. And I think the translation scholars could be expected to at least understand, they'd be prepared to listen to other languages. Dilek Dizda brought this up this morning, that um, you can just, just to listen to other languages. We have here 14 languages. I have um, classes where several languages are represented, even if the other people don't understand them, just to hear the languages is enriching. And there are ways of um, organizing conferences where um, creativity and imagination helps you, prevents you from just sticking to English. I'm saying this because this was an issue last week with the speakers. And we had an excellent example yesterday from Professor Schippel, who gave her introductory words in German where she felt at ease and so on. And we had the text in English on the overhead projector. That is just one of many ways in which one could actually make other languages visible. And this is what I'm talking about. Of course, now you all understand what I'm saying because I'm speaking English and so on. And I can't go into this um, topic here because I simply have not the time. Okay. Um, sorry, is, is that better now? Um, but this is an issue I think that EST will have to consider in the future because um, I'm afraid it means that um, a lot of people are excluded. They feel excluded if English is not one of their languages. And I know many people who have left EST for that reason and many people who haven't joined EST for that reason. And please, could it be um, an issue for the future? Um, I've had other, I've mentioned the Middle Europäische Symposium. I want to close by some, another symposium that, that took place last year, because I have actually been working since the um, days of the older generation. And um, we had another wonderful symposium, and this again was um, multilingual, or let's say it was, it was um, one, of its com one of its subjects was um, uh, multilingualism. Um, and um, this book appeared last week, Die Multiminoritätengesellschaft. I sent out an invitation to people I now understand German. This small book will be presented after the end of the Congress in a little um, speech of about 10 minutes, and after that there will be a few drinks, and if it'll be in German. Um, if anyone hasn't had the invitation and feels like coming, you are very, very welcome to um, see what I mean by this, because this is actually my vision, for the second part of my vision of EST. Europe, cultural diversity, linguistic diversity, and communication through translation within this space. And I'd like to close by saying that I actually had the idea of founding um, another little society, because EST was getting so anglophone, and calling it the Central Europäisches the Europäische Initiative für Translationswissenschaft. I brought up this idea three years ago in Graz, and everybody said, what a wonderful idea it is. Let's go ahead. Yes, do you know how much work it is? Are we going to start all over again, all of this? Um, wouldn't it be a better idea if EST didn't simply have part of Central Europe and other languages on its program? And um, with that, I'd like to um, pass on the microphone to you.